ಸರ್ಜರಿ Uh, Prof had his education in Kandy and from University of Pennsylvania, uh, his MBBS. And then uh, Prof left Sri Lanka and uh, started working in the UK. And he got his surgical training down there in the UK and uh, went through the CCT and uh, also worked as a senior lecturer in surgery at the University of Birmingham. And uh, after about 10 years, Uh, after being working there as a full uh, fully qualified consultant and completing a M- research md from the university of birmingham and uh, also he worked at the mayo for a while researching on the uh, anal sphincter complex uh, mainly his thesis is on uh, anal sphincter complex and uh, then he returned to sri lanka and joined the university of kalania uh, as uh, as a senior lecturer and then immediately as a chair professor of surgery uh, and since then i think he's one of the he is the leading uh, researcher if you ask me in surgery uh, as far as sri lanka is concerned he's published in all the prestigious index journals including the bjs uh, and uh, annals of surgery and so on and got over 1500 uh, citations and a uh, very high h index as well uh, so i think uh, he has been the inspiration to a lot of us who uh, worked at kalania and uh, passed out from kalania as well as uh, trained at uh, the prof unit surgery as surgeons and he was the inspiration of our research Uh, as students we were not exposed to a lot of research in our days uh, soon after soon after my mbbs i was lucky enough to work under prof as a demonstrator and he showed me what uh, surgical research can do and how it can change your thinking even when you're practicing as a clinician so i think this is a very very good opportunity for our students to to get inspired by a person of caliber is he so, i mean if you talk about surgical research there are research of different quality but uh, prof is right up there along with the peers international colleagues uh, publishing and uh, working in the same uh, level so it's a great opportunity for the students i think uh, to listen to him and get inspired at least few of you will take up in i hope discipline you go i think taking up research helps you to be a better clinician as well uh, he is the one who gave us the 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 perception of uh, being academic surgeons or physicians who can operate rather than just being a mechanics or surgeons who do their jobs uh, he made us physicians who can operate so and the, the new concept of academic surgery in sri lanka was actually brought about by him so he's still up there with all the indices in uh, publications and also on so i guess uh, this is going to be really interesting uh, and the topic for today the topic he has selected is also going to be very interesting uh, how to be inquisitive so i think for medical students if you can be inquisitive that is that is all you need to be a good student as well as a good doctor uh, so i think we'll have a very fruitful 20 minutes up ahead and uh, if you're happy we could start prof yeah i'm good thank you pramod
Do you want me to take off? Can you hear me quiet? Yes, sir, we can hear you. All right, so um, uh, thank you, uh, Rohan, Pramod, and Chanukov specifically for having asked me to come on this program. You know, I have, I've done a lot of things, but this Zoom thing is, is, a, is a bit of a new thing for me. So um, please bear, the internet may crash at times, but it'll come back on. That's the, 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 the issue with what we face every day in life. It's about surgery and everything does not go smooth. Uh, but I hope this will go as smooth as silk. Um, what I'm here to talk to you specifically to medical students is about the uniqueness of the human mind. Uh, and that uniqueness is specifically uh, your, um, your innate ability to inquire or your inquisitiveness. And this uniqueness of the human mind is a development of your prefrontal cortex, which we all have as, 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 as the human species. And that enables differentiation from uh, instinctive intelligence. For instance, in animals, their instinctive intelligence is based on their ability to feed when they're hungry, to be able to shelter, to be able to bear uh, young ones and nurture the young ones and then send them out into the open to take on and ensure this, the, the, the genesis and the, and the preservation of the species. Human beings are very much much associated with all of these life skills and life chores. But in addition, we have the gift of the prefrontal cortex. And that is what uh, we have in our ability to analyze thought and to be able to differentiate and also to, uh, to reach depths of, of, of basic science and then develop new things based on that core of knowledge. So using the analytical mind, I'd like to give you the example of uh, such an analytical mind in a simple everyday thing that we see. And that, of course, is the development of the Tata nano car, which we all uh, are familiar with. Now, as you know, the conventional car has four studs on its wheel structure. Uh, the engineers at Tata developed a three studded star uh, a, a, tire, a wheel structure. And the reason they did this is to be able to save that single wheel nut, which means four wheel nuts in a car and large number of wheel nuts in a production line of cars that would eventually give them the cost benefit of selling this small car. Um, so that is an example of uh, an inquiring mind of why we could do things like the way we did this for nano, and why should we not be conformative in uh, using the four studded star structure? And, 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 and as you see, the nano car is now everywhere. Just take a look at one of its wheels, and you will be amazed at the three studded wheel structure in the Tata car. So you can use analysis to go down to the depths of uh, a core and then use the ingenuity of your human mind based on workings of your free prefrontal cortex to develop new things. And that's an example of that. But you can also use analytical intelligence for, for self-centered reasons and for development of things like weapons and every other uh, aspect of human life that we see now, which probably is not a favorable idea, but yet that is an, a perfect example of how the prefrontal cortex can assist in analysis and development. Now we are all born with a basic blank canvas. Uh, the reason I tell you that is because when you have an experience with children or have seen children, we all have either in our relatives or amongst our patients and uh, families. If you give a small child who is able to sit and uh, decipher for itself, and also ability to develop dexterity, this child, if given a toy, the first thing that they will do is take it apart. And the reason they do that, children do that, is because of their innate uh, degree of differentiation, innate ability to be able to get in and find out what's going on in the depths of this toy, uh, albeit to the annoyance of the parents who um, don't understand all of this. Having said that, the toy, after the toy has been taken apart, 
the child is not able to fix it because they, the child in this situation lacks the core knowledge of how this toy was constructed. So ensuing from this example, we understand that we are all presented with the gifts of intelligence. We are presented with the ability to analyze. We have a blank canvas in front of our lives, which we are free to draw on. We are free to draw the greatest piece of our working li lives. But some of us do not do this. Some of us fail to do that. Why then do some, if not all of us, not reach the pinnacle of invention? After all, we are in a, a profession that is caring, but is also endearing. And also the responsibility is on this current generation of medics to take medical care and healthcare to a different level. And uh, if we have not done that, then we would not have been in this position of advanced medicine. So I think it's important to re-nurture or keep alive or rekindle your uh, art of thinking, your art of analysis, and be mindful of that. The reason we don't do this, I think, it is because of the need to conform. Society is such a structured thing these days. It works within a framework these days, and it's important to conform. And if you don't conform, one, uh, one as a student is seen as somebody who's a troublemaker, somebody who uh, does not follow the class, or indeed somebody who uh, just wants to create trouble. It, it would take an intelligent teacher to be able to pick that person out and nurture that person in the way that most people would do in the advanced communities in advanced parts of the world. So the stereotype thinking process, while it is good, it makes life easier for everyone, particularly teachers, it may not be the best in the world. Uh, having said that, I think it's important for formal education to be a process, because if we uh, are not formally educated, uh, like that child, we don't have, wouldn't have the ability to think that is our native gift, but also take things apart, again, our native gift. And then if without formal education, I think we, not, we may not be able to put that toy together or put that structure together or put anything together, which is what we do in surgery. So uh, there has to be formal education. Um, and this formal education is what we all go through in the process of our curriculums in high school, uh, medical school, undergraduate school, postgraduate school. But I think uh, in the process of developing um, the, pro the, the methods of formal education, sticking to frameworks within an educational program, sticking to examination frameworks where you don't, even at exams these days, different from when I was a student, people are asked standardized questions. We don't actually give the bright and the wide and free thinking individual, the ability to ask a question that is out of the box because that might be considered unfair. Uh, and that might be a deficiency in our current system across the world. I think formal education should go hand in hand with uh, informal education. And that would develop the inspiring mind, the inquiring mind, which in many ways had been informal. The ultimate package, of course, is to produce that individual, in this case, the individual doctor, who is able to care for patients, but is also able to think about what may not be the best aspects of this care. Think deeper about how we can do things differently and how we can better be care for all, sometimes in the best of resources, some are, some, at times, at other times, in um, resource limited areas where we work very much in Sri Lanka. This would certainly lead us to greater heights. I think, sadly, that this pathway of formal education has now played a lesser role in the education of professionals latterly. The Americans, on the other hand, in their early formative years, recognized the importance of the concept of the development of the free thinking mind. They were not only interested in producing medical graduates, but they also aimed at producing innovative medical graduates. So what did they do? The medical education process in America is a two-step process. It's a two-tiered process. In the first process, what 
the student will learn is a basic undergraduate program of inquiring where free thinking is encouraged. You can actually engage in any degree, unlike how we formally think here. You can be a part of any degree program, pass that exam, and then sit the medical um, college admission tests, pass the test to get into medical school. So everybody has a basic knowledge of biology and science, but they may have done music. They have may have studied in, in other areas, in wildlife, for instance, or in zoology or botany. But the important thing that these graduates have, which we probably uh, fall short of because there is no such training program for that, is their ability to think freely. Once the three years or four years have passed in which students from 18 to about 21 are trained to think freely, they then get into medical school at about 22 or 23 on average and pass out of medical school with what they call is an MD program, very much similar to our MBBS program in, in this part of the world. And so at the end of the day, they have what is a core knowledge in medicine based on their four years of MD program. And they have the ability to think as free thinkers and at free will based on their first three years of undergraduate. So I think it's a great program. Uh, this program is now being followed uh, in most parts of Australia. You can't get into an Australian medical school without um, a basic science degree. Uh, some other programs in Europe are following this path. But when I inquired into uh, why we may not be adopting this path, um, and I realized, and you all realize that we take our time, our strikes take on time. So five years becomes six and seven years. Uh, whilst those kids have uh, really moved on, we tend to struggle in our own battles here within this part of the world. That is not, however, going to hamper the individual student or the doctor who might want to develop his or her own skills that we all got gifted of at the, at the time of birth. And that, of course, is our skill and, and, and our innate ability to think freely. In order to be able to do that, I think we need to think about how we can do that. And the ways I think as the first steps to the development of all of this would be, in my mind, to take short breaks out of our busy schedules and to enable the free mind to explore and think about what we do and why we do. We do that. I've done that. I've been a proponent of that. I'm sure uh, Professor Sirivardhana and uh, Dr. Chandra Singh do that on a regular basis. And we do that specifically to sit and think about what we have done in the past three months and how we should be going and discuss things about outside our curriculum. Because the free mind will only work when it's not being bombarded by uh, outside influences. And so you need to be free. Uh, we know this from the great example of the Lord uh, Buddha, where he would sit under uh, the, uh, the bow tree and, and meditate and think about, ponder about life for many, many hours at a stretch, a process that we now know is, is called meditation, mindfulness. But I think uh, the Lord Buddha did this in order to be able to achieve, uh, achieve the, uh, develop that skill develop that free mind, develop the free thinking, and give him ideas and answers to the questions he posed in his mind before he actually sat down to meditate. And I think this is, this is really a, a program that we can all develop if we spend time. Unfortunately, our busy lives, our student lives are so packed in with uh, lots of uh, curricular work that we have failed to understand that as we progress and we define progress by uh, passing our exams for short, getting a first class degree and moving on, we have failed to recognize that informal education and the nurturing of our innate minds of inquisitiveness have been shadowed and, and dimmed as a result of us not lacking time or not having time for development of such a skill. I also think that as medical students, you need to become comfortable with asking questions, no matter how small or how embarrassing because every question that you would develop in your mind would also be asked by somebody else, but that person too is inhibited. Because this would be the first step in taking away the inhibition in our socially conforming society. I think as teachers, we need to encourage the concept of development of free thought, 
during informal sessions deliberately put aside for open discussion. We don't have that in our curricula. We actually need to have tutorials where there is no tutorial topic, but you develop a, a topic of discussion and everybody's mind in that tutorial class needs to be allowed to wander and, uh, and discussed, uh, points discussed so that uh, we, this, is, this is actually fertilizer for our free thinking minds. We are so, so very switched off in our pathways that to take the formal route, albeit non-stimulating, becomes such an advantageous, lazy route. But most of us do that because it's a means to an end. We fail to take the hard route where we develop our free mind and our inquisitive minds. A simple start would be to start to ask questions of why again, ask yourself the question why. And when I was in medical school, school, unlike when I was in nowadays, that would need to you would not need for a teacher to respond. If you ask the question why, at least once a week, your teacher is on the net. You can look at Wikipedia, for instance, look at the research, current research. Such an advantage that medical students and learners now in this day are at compared to when certainly I was a medical student. We did not need to, uh, to, to we had no facility to use a net. We had to go up to the library and that too, where the books were limited. So when you get there, finally to the library, you'll find that the book that you wanted has been borrowed and there's no book left in the library. So this thing has been made so easy that I think you need to be mindful of this inquiring mind that you need to nurture in order to be take this uh, to a different step. Try and develop the art of being mindful. I think it's, it's a special process in which uh, keep keeps you in the moment and you will often feed and nurture your inquiring or inquisitive mind. I think practice of mindfulness is a different topic. I think uh, I suggest to the organizers of this uh, lecture series that they have uh, a step-by-step -step session of uh, practicing mindfulness because I think mindfulness is the is the basis, is the first step to development or nurturing and encouragement of that um, really inquisitive mind. With these few words, I think I'm, I've come to a halt now. I'm going to stop here. I'd be happy to take lecture, uh, lecture questions, but I also take this opportunity to wish everyone watching here uh, a very happy Christmas and holiday season. And thank you for taking the time out at this time to be able to listen to this lecture and contribute to any questions and discussions that you may have. Thank you, Rohan and uh, Pramod and Chanukka. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any questions you can either ask or send to the chat? I read them out. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Sir, uh, is there a way to... Uh, we kindle that uh, free thinking ability once if someone that has lost it, like uh, if they lose the ability to think and uh, free think, is there a way to rekindle that ability, some, some tips or tricks to uh, get it back on the process? First of all, you must, if you want to achieve something, you must be mindful of the fact that, that you want to achieve something. So if you want to get through your third MB exam or your final MB exam or even your second MB exam, you need to be mindful that you have a target ahead of you. So in that process, I think you need to understand, perhaps read a bit more about the unconscious mind. And there's lots of articles about the unconscious mind. And the way to rekindle that is to, uh, I presume you're a medical student at Kalanir, uh, is to ask at least of the Department of Surgery to give you time out of one tutorial perhaps to be able to sit and think and discuss uh, informal questions about the problems that you might have. For instance, you might see uh, uh, the use of a urinary catheter in patients who are having surgery, and you probably don't understand the entire re role for the, the, the placement of this urinary catheter. Maybe that is a question that you can ponder over and discuss and find out why the urinary catheter is there, uh, why uh, is it not removed immediately after surgery? Why do you want to have it right on in for three or four days after the operation? 
because you know, for instance, that the urinary catheter and the and catheter associated infection is one of the commonest cause of hospital acquired infection, a huge problem in countries across the world uh, requiring expensive antibiotics. So why do we need urinary catheters? Why, for instance, then this is my free thinking mind. I'm just I'm just moving ahead. Uh, why, for instance, can we not use a suprapubic catheter, which does not go through the urinary tract and goes through uh, uh, through the skin and 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 goes straight into the urinary bladder uh, and uh, and maybe another route uh, that prevents um, infection, for instance. I'm I'm not 100% sure, but this is my free thinking mind. So you should be able to develop this mind. You should take away the inhibition of uh, not asking questions that you think might be foolish in or non-conformative in your mind. And perhaps one one way to go forward, I'm suggesting to Professor Sevadana and Dr. Chandra Singha that we should be developing at least one of the tutorials in perhaps a two month session, or even take time off to develop this free thinking tutorial program. It's a very unique program it will be to develop this free thinking attitude in small group classes. Um, if you don't have that ability, and if you are looking at an individual ability, then read up more about articles that have the unconscious mind. And one of the things that I might ask you in a practical method is to ask a question. Think about everything you did for the day when you go to sleep at night. When you knock off to sleep at night, your subconscious mind becomes predominant as your consciousness levels wane away. Ask yourself the questions. They've, in fact, the, the prophets of the unconscious mind say that if you want to remember anything, put that down in the last thing in your mind before you go to sleep and it gets deposited there like your random access memory in a computer uh, that rekindles your unconscious mind. So the little steps, uh, you can read a lot about it in the net. First of all, become interested in it and develop this amongst the three or four of you who can then propagate the idea of free will thinking uh, amidst this huge chaos of formal education, which is a necessity, but is not absolutely important for uh, development of high-skilled, high skilled, high uh, and high-end research workers who will take medicine from this era to a different era in 10 years. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. It answers me perfectly, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, uh, sir, I also have a question. Um, so in um, our curriculum, like uh, what we are being taught uh, Every day is to follow this uh, set of instructions and to get uh, full marks and uh, to do what the others are doing. That's sort of what uh, our education system is doing to us. So I was wondering, so like by improving our innate ability to think inquisitively, is it uh, pos will it um, in what sort of a way will it uh, directly or indirectly help us? in uh, the formal aspect of education, that so-called formal aspect of education that is going on in our countries? Right, so uh, that's a very interesting and deep question, requires deep thought, but uh, let me answer it very briefly. I think there's a, there are two paths, ways of gaining, pro, gaining education knowledge. And at the end of the day, what you want out of yourself, maybe just to become a, a practitioner of medicine and not to think beyond. But that might be a shortfall because even in everyday practice in medicine, there are things that you can do better that you don't want to do because you don't want to spend that time. Uh, you, you think that time spent doing something unnecessary or extra might be um, uh, loss of financial resources, for instance, loss of financial income, for instance. And people are so base, based on materialistic wealth these days that we've forgotten that the whole process of why we are here is based on other people's research from previous years. So there might be a few of us, including yourself, who may want to look at it in a different way. And in order to be able to look at it in a different way, you need to expend more time. Now you understand, if you look at the, the, the performance of athletes, uh, the, the top athletes in the world who perform consistently, you go into their lives, and what you will see is in addition to their formal training that they do, there are lots of spaces of time that they spend on informal training. That is outside their formal curriculum, away from the coach. The coach is home asleep, but this person is training. His training is mind. 
his training of he's thinking about the, the number of shots he's to, going to make he's thinking about getting a positive shot every time he makes a stroke that sort of thing so that is investment in time most people are not willing to invest in time because time these days unfortunately sadly is money time these days is uh, is 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 as is, is a commodity that cannot be bought for anything time is racing away and if you don't spend that time forget the money if you don't spend that time doing your formal education engaging your formal education you think you may have lost out because the next day brings in more homework brings in more assignments brings in more this and that so we are all engulfed in this uh, uh, in this ocean of information overload unfortunately that becomes a part of our formal education process and we really don't have time uh, certainly in the medical program to be able to invest in that extracurricular activity of uh, development of your free thinking mind so um, I, I think it would be good just like the americans they spend three years doing that or four years doing that the Aus australians spend three years doing this we need to develop a, a process within our process uh, and because i see that the department of surgery here at, at Kalania is, is, is comprises of individuals who understand and think are like-minded and who think that this is an important thing. I think a good first step would be to approach the, 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 the teachers at your teachers at Ragama at, at, at the Department of Surgeon and ask them if they can make some time for this free thinking. I'm sure they'd love to do that. The problem is you cannot do this formally because it has to be passing through curriculum development committees. Uh, it has gone through the dean, it has been passed at various levels and then come back in. That alone is conformity. And nobody's interested in all of this because it takes time. And by the time you do that, you're out of the system. There's somebody else to follow on. So um, a lot of stuff, a lot of informal things can get done by you communicating with your teachers, perhaps willing, being willing to forego one tutorial for the development of your informal education. And I'll be very quite, quite really happy to come and contribute physically even. Uh, because um, what I see is that we need individuals of the nature of you who can think in these lines to be taking medicine to a different level. We can develop and innovate a lot here in this part of the world. We have it all here because you know that necessity is the mother of invention. And there's no place in the world that requires better care and necessary evolution than South Asia or our part of the world and if if we are the people who have the necessity why is it that innovation happens in the west i can't think of the answer here uh, the only thing i can think of is that we don't think about innovation we think we are incapable of innovation we think that uh, we don't have the finances and you don't need too much finances to be honest it's harder to get financial securement of your projects abroad than it is in sri lanka because there's so much finance so little people doing this research uh, uh, work and projects that there are grants available for virtually everything and anything the important thing is think about investing time you need to do this from within your heart you don't expect your teachers to be able to put in the formal informal education within your formal curriculum you should take the initiative and go speak with your teachers and see if they can develop a formal uh, edu informal education within the formal process that is the way it's going to go otherwise it needs a sea change uh, and there is no political will to do that. I could see that change over the last five years when I was in uh, Ragam. And so um, it's not the way that I would like medical education to go, to be honest. Uh, I think uh, you need to go back to thinking. You need to be, go back to encouragement of your thinking. And there's only one set of teachers, as I can see. And those are the teachers who have developed this program here. So I'm sure you have a great opportunity to in incorporate your informal education into your formal education process thank you for the question um sir uh, i have a question um it's a bit specific to our situation uh what, which we have right now uh currently for us um we have finished all of our uh, lectures in medical school for third year and fourth year and we have about a year where we will be spending almost the full day uh, in the wards so can we use that opportunity to like um, get uh, more out of it and uh, what would so, be your you advice regarding that? that? Are you telling me that before you start your final year program that you have a year, a gap year? 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, because uh, because of the pandemic, we couldn't go to clinical, so we had we have been doing online lectures so far. So that's a great opportunity. You you know you you need to you need to be able to use that year to be able to uh, define what goals you need to do. So you you need to get together with your teachers and perhaps colleagues of yours. Find out how many people want to join this program of uh, free will thinking or informal education. Perhaps you can call it informal medical education here or surgical education. Sit down and have some aims and guidelines about what you want to do. So what is your aim to one, aim number one, to focus on development of the free thinking mind. Aim number two, how do we encourage other students who are junior to us and who do not have this wonderful opportunity of a year of free thinking process uh, to, to ask questions? You can start up a, a program that says it's all right to ask questions. It's not all right to stay silent after lecture because in most Asian communities, you have a question, uh, you have a lecturer, and then you have any more questions and you don't uh, get the questions fired. So either they, you understand that they know everything or they don't know nothing. But I'm sure 100% of people have questions, they don't ask it. So you, that is a kind of inhibition that you need to take away from you. So have a few don't have many objectives, have a few objectives and develop a program. It should start from you, not from your teachers, um, of what you want to achieve in terms of informal education. And if you want to find out more about informal thinking processes, there's plenty on the net you can go to. Uh, develop your guide, your aims, no more than about three or four. And then we can develop, I'm, I'm quite happy to help, develop a, 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 an informal education program that focuses on the development of all of this. That may even include programs on meditation, how to meditate, but, um, and I think it must, but that is a start. So that's a good start. I think you should uh, be, you know, every, they say that every cloud has a gray cloud has a silver lining. And in this situation, this COVID pandemic has given you the wonderful opportunity of taking that year to do what you want. In addition to obtaining formal education, albeit, uh, not structured and uh, and take it to a different level. So you use this opportunity and I'll be happy to help. Uh, so there is another question someone has typed up. Uh, uh, he asked, uh, sir, I understand formal education and inclusiveness are both important. Uh, sir, how much weight would you put on each in making uh, us a good doctor? I, I think formal education is absolutely necessary. There is no going away from it. Informal education is something that should be there all the time, but it should like a signal rekindle. So it should be a part of your structure it should be a part of your fabric it should be a part of the way you work um, uh, and and only when you are aware of the fact that there is this question to be asked that you will ask yourself in order to be able to develop that because we haven't been through the process of development of informal education and i'll tell you an example of this uh, when you go through school particularly when you go through uh, junior school and high school the whole focus is on passing exams uh, the case of the, the 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 common sense thinking child. In fact, intelligence is common sense, and the case of the common sense thinking person or the kid is diminished. And I'll give you an example of what happened here to a person I knew. There was this young school student in his very very early years of life, who in Montessori school was asked to color shapes of animals that were outlined on a white paper. So there was the elephant and this kid colored the elephant black. There was the horse and he colored the horse brown. There was the, sh the, the camel and he colored the camel in the appropriate color. But because the sheep was white, he did not color it, he just left it. And this kid was then taken to task by the student's teacher who said, why did you leave this uncolored? You should have colored this. And so what you can see is the teacher conforming to what is required of her 
but the student thinking differently in a way was reprimanded for that now that is exactly what formal education does to our common sense thinking approach in formal education so the percentage of all of this i can't 100 percent tell you uh, we we all of our education is formal but there is no reason why in the process of formal education you cannot ask you the question why in in each lecture for a day if you ask the question why and you will only ask yourself the question why or in on the words you will ask the question why if you are mindful you are living that moment if your mind is somewhere else then you probably don't understand what's going on and then you plan to get this off the notes of your friend when you're at home uh, at the end of the day that's not the way to do it the way to do it is to be in that moment to figure out what's going on ask yourself the question why doesn't matter if you can't bring out the the answer or the question at the point in time you need to go back and develop this so informal education in your in your question i can see that your mind is structured but that should not be the way formal education is structured it works within a framework informal education should be a part of you it's like when you touch something that is hot you will reflexly take your hand away from it because it's dangerous in the same way informal education and the ability to ask yourself why and the ability to ask yourself why is it that we cannot do things better than this should be a, a trigger should be a sensorium that is waiting to be triggered by the situation when you face it in order to be able to have that trigger and be able to achieve that status you need to be able to train your mind and the first step in mind training is exactly what i've talked about and what we talked about and the questions that were asked and were answered so i cannot give you an answer about what percentage it should be it should not be that structured i think informal education should be a part of your daily life daily process when you're on the on the roads coming to work you see something ask yourself why can we not do this better why is it that uh, that that we take so much time to get to work uh, from home uh, can we not do this better so if you keep asking those questions for things outside medicine and inside medicine you will probably nurture and fertilize your informal thought process. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you, perhaps somebody can contribute to this answer, the, the percentage or the proportion of informal education, but it would be good to get together and have timeouts as we do uh, sometimes in surgery to figure out what free informal education is all about because we have forgotten all about this. Uh, we need to rekindle, uh, if you like, this whole thing about informal education. And the way we can do that is to actually spend time thinking, okay, we are going to in discuss informal education. We are going to discuss mind development. We're going to discuss the process of how, why we don't ask questions and how we should do better. So that is, that is the whole purpose of understanding that I, I think you should be approaching the professor and asking him or uh, anybody else why we cannot have a session out of work that will help develop this whole thinking process now having done this all of you might not reach that pinnacle but we don't have enough of people reaching that pinnacle because we don't see enough of people in in medical education at least in the faculties that i see who have this process of innovative thinking it's not good becoming a senior lecturer or a lecturer and a university professor and at the end of the day marking your your ticks off on the on the promotion box and saying that you've achieved anything it is so good that if you do that in the process of achieving all of this you can make surgery better or make medicine better or make it different that is the the product of formal and informal education so think about what i've told you i can't tell you exactly how much should be informal ideally every formal process should be should be should be back or there should be an informal education question process in your mind all the time waiting to be triggered by things that you don't understand thank you thank you sir uh, there's uh, two more questions sent to the chat first sometimes when we ask questions that seem out of the exam material or might seem unwanted sometimes our own peers has a tendency to laugh at us any tips on how not to be discouraged uh, this is not only here this is everywhere in the world it's a, it's a society uh, the reason why they laugh is because 
um, because they think they are, the, the minds are so conformed that uh, they don't understand how you're thinking. So you obviously, when you think and answer, ask those questions, you uh, have to understand that you're thinking differently. And you need to be proud of the fact that you think differently. The other reason why we don't um, ask questions and we are embarrassed is because of our social and cultural norms. In South Asia, we fail to do that. So perhaps one of the ways in which we can do that is to encourage everybody to uh, ask the question. It's okay to ask questions. Perhaps this would be a huge banner in your lecture hall. We should be having uh, teachers encouraging students by saying, it's okay to ask questions. I don't know if you still have the tutorial rooms up there above the dean's office um, uh, below the library when I was uh, in the faculty, but you, you know, each tutorial room should have a banner saying, it's okay to ask questions and make okay to ask questions the way uh, to get about a tutorial process. Um, aside from that, it takes a lot of guts, but once you break the ice and you need a, a strong personality for that, once you break the ice as a first student asking question, I can guarantee there'll be two others asking different questions. So this is a, a problem that I faced in my, when I was a medical student, often, um, uh, people thought differently and they probably make names out of what you ask questions. So they'll call you nicknames. Uh, but that is a risk that you take. But it, you have to understand that this is development. Uh, you have only one chance in life to go through university. Uh, one, no sooner you become a doctor, your guidance changes totally. Um, so, you know, you, in this five years of, of your university education to become a doctor, uh, if you don't ask questions, uh, you won't get the answers. And you will learn uh, to, to develop the attitude of getting by without asking questions. So you should start a movement. Just like movements start about anti-ragging in the first year, you should start a movement which says it's all right to ask questions. And it's not difficult to uh, uh, start a movement on, on programs such as you have on Facebook. And so uh, when you do that, I think uh, it'll be an interesting part of social research if you can if you can use this as a facebook post and see how much more people become accustomed to asking questions see uh, if i was giving the same lecture in the lecture hall at ragama i guarantee based on what i know of my experience of medical students there will be not one question but here i'm getting at least five questions which is very good based on sri lankan medical student standards so i think if you can remain anonymous, then you ask the question. No sooner you are in the forefront uh, and you become recognized, then you perhaps are inhibited. And I think you need to get rid of that inhibition. It is all right to ask questions. It's all right to be faced and to be stand face to face in the front of your whole batch with a question that would make a difference to other people's lives. Because many of your colleagues would have the same question but are frightened to ask. So, uh, I mean, I think it's a behavioral issue that we need to get together and overcome. But, um, but that's the best I can do for you. Thank you. Um, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Um, another question. Like, um, uh, from what I see right now, like, uh, it looks like it's, it's an option to, uh, like, ask questions and, like, have this inquisitiveness and mindfulness right now. And uh, I was just thinking like, um, if you're getting ready for an exam, like um, what we usually do is like we practice essay questions and then go and like repeat and regurgitate that in the paper. So like, uh, do you by any chance like think that this uh, process of like uh, conforming too much to the formal education uh, has a backward pull on this in inquisitiveness? Definitely it has, but it's a necessary evil. You need to store a certain amount of core knowledge that requires a large investment in time and effort. Uh, because medical science is advancing rapidly, you probably require to retain more core knowledge than I did. But you have the advantage that you don't have to retain extra knowledge outside the core because uh, if, for instance, uh, uh, 25 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, somebody who's got a first class, 
they'd probably get a first class because of their ability to retain and regurgitate. Now, somebody who gets a first class should be applauded for reasonable reasoning skills because if you can reason, then you can find the answer. The answer is on your device. Any answer is on your device. You don't need a library to go to. So I think formal education has to change, uh, has to accommodate these changes of how we live our life. Um, so uh, definitely, by beginning to conform, by beginning to answer the questions that you are expected to answer, you're only following on as a university student who took off from the A-level exam. In the A-level exam, it's important. This is such a competitive exam. Doesn't matter whether you're bright or not so bright. If you get into medical school, that's all you need to do. And in order to achieve that, you need to spend 23 out of your 24 hours of your day focusing on how you can achieve that. Now, that, that is understandable because of the lack of facilities and lack of medical education slots in our part of the world. But at least once you've gotten out of that and your first year in medical school, you understand that 99.9% .9 of, of people who get into medical school get out as doctors. So you're not going to fail. There is no must do this. You, you, you will pass the exam. You may not get a class, but at least you would have passed the exam. But the important thing is you need to be thinking about how to how to think uh, in order to be able to teach you how to think because as an A-level student coming into university, we've all forgotten about how to think. We've all forgotten, we've all closed our doors to uh, informal thinking. And so um, this must be rekindled. If you can do this for your juniors coming in every year from A-levels into medical school, then that would be a great introduction for somebody to rethink about how they can re, uh, restructure their thinking process. But definitely, as you say, um, you're right in what you say. But also, I think in this process of formal education, I think you must be the energy. You must be, the, when I say you, the student, you must be the energy for change. And you can inculcate this change. You can initiate this change by speaking to your teachers and asking them to, to see how we can do better with uh, development of this informal education process. It's not easy if it's formalized. So if you're, for instance, your teacher takes it up to the faculty board, that'll have to go through a curriculum committee. And there'll be lots of discussion in that curriculum committee and eventually it might get shut down. But if you do this at your local level, at the department level, um, uh, without too much of uh, noise that goes out of your universe, your, your faculty or your department, then it will happen. Uh, it will happen in a way that you will enjoy. And I think that is the way to go because the, the official processes, official routes don't produce results that are instant. And you don't have time for that. You want the change to happen like yesterday, not, not in 10 years. Uh, in order to make that change, you can do that. Um, the fact that uh, the Department of Surgery produced this innovative Zoom lessons during the COVID was, uh, was, was, was a remarkable. Um, I don't think any of our surgeons went to the curriculum committee and say we need to do this uh, formal education pro program now informally. Uh, I see a beautiful uh, research paper written out of the experience of this. So this is exactly the way I, I see. You need to be a breakaway within the system that will help. It. So the best way you can do this is by approaching your professor, certainly in surgery and the, your teachers in surgery and ask them if they can now make this happen for you. And they will be only too pleased. I know the people, and I'm sure that they will only be too pleased to uh, provide the answers to your problems. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question. Sir, as you correctly said, the main focus of majority of students is the exam. Not to blame anyone, as that's how we have been wired till now. My question is, can we use the exam itself? as a tool to build up the inquisitive mind in students? If so, sir, how can we move forward in that direction? Yeah, so the way to do that is very easy. Um, uh, it's to use, use uh, the examination process right from day one in your learning program. So if you, for instance, have um, uh, a lecture on, uh, on uh, for instance, um, the the 
post-operative complications of appendicectomy? Simple question. Um, you need to develop the uh, question and answers for yourself, just like many books that look at this. Uh, once you do that, you can do that by yourself or you can do that amongst four or five of you to try and develop this lecture. In other words, at the end of asking the questions, you should be able to give the reason why the answer is right. In one question, the answer will be right. In four questions, the answer will be not appropriate. Uh, and you should also be able to give the reasons for why the answer in four questions is not appropriate. That way it gives you an analytical pro thinking process or kickstarts your analytical thinking process. And there are lots of books um, that, that have questions and answers, particularly the American style books. And that is why I'm a fan of American education because they've got it right. Um, uh, if you look at some of the books, question and answers books, even in the MCQs, complications of appendicectomy, the right answer is this, da, da, da. The not so right answers are the other four. If you go to the back of the book, they'll tell you why the right answer is right. And they will tell you why the not so right answers are not right or not appropriate. And that alone is an exercise that can develop your skills based on examination. So it's an interesting way to study. Uh, I think you need to spend time again because once you've done the lecture, you need to go back and, and reverse engineer the lecture, if you like, to be able to deliver these, these, um, these exam questions that you will enjoy doing, but you need to invest in time. So instead of studying a lecture and, and making short notes and revising the whole thing within the hour, that will probably take two hours. It's a slower process, but if five people can get their heads together for five lectures, that increases the efficiency of the process. But it's a great way of studying, and it's a great way, I think, a uh, good question of developing your analytical or at least keeping your analytical mind alive based on your exam. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yep, yep. go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, do you think doing basic sciences such as A-levels in a different language, such as Sinhala, and uh, doing uh, coming to university and doing medicine in English or in another language, has anything to do with uh, shutting down the free thinking process of a person? No, I think I think there are two things that, uh, if you look at the formal development of the brain processing, uh, are important, and that is why I think Sri Lankans are such such great um, great people when, particularly when when we comes to education, because we have a multilinguistic education process, and although you speak in Sinhalese or Sinhala. Uh, you have some um, some stream of acquisition of the English language, either in your daily life, or uh, English as a as a as a as a subject, or you see it on television, or you have the ability to watch it on television. You also have another language, as in Tamil. And uh, the more we learn languages uh, in our early age, so if you guys get married and have children, teach them languages because that is an important aspect of developing the lateral parts of those salsa in your brain or in the, in the, in the, in the higher centers. Uh, so language skills is important and mathematics. That's all you need for brain developing the young age. So as you come into medical school from mainly a, a single streams, being a single stream student and to learn in English is a, is a dual process. It, it's a doubly difficult thing because the stress of medical school, I still remember my first day in medical school, it's very stressful. Um, I was a student of the English medium, but I was at Peradeniya, which got taught for the first year, we got taught in Singhala. And uh, I, I did the reverse of what you did. Most of you would study in Singhala and then come in and learn English here. But that, at that time, the first day is always taught in Singhala because of the, the English, continuing English program. And so I understand the difficulties of language but uh, it's an additional stress, um, not necessarily though. Uh, I think you need to look at everything has its advantage and disadvantage. And the advantage of this is that developing a language skill, being able to speak in another language or even improving that language in increases your, 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 your parts of the brain that lay dormant. And we know uh, from neuroscience research that 10% of our brain is functional, 90% is 
non-functional waiting to happen, particularly in the supratentorial regions. And so language skills and developmental language skills is an important aspect. Of course, that takes time. Uh, and therefore, it would take the time that you would otherwise have used in informal, the informal education process of, uh, of developing your uh, inquiring skill. But if you can be mindful of the fact that you need to ask questions all the time, you won't let it go. It stays there waiting to happen and you won't shut it off completely. So I don't think that learning in one language at the A levels and then coming in to study mostly in English at, the, uh, at, at medical school is necessarily a bad thing. I think it's some of the better things that could happen albeit enforced, I think it's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There is one more question in the chat. There are organizations that focus on the informal training or life training, and one of them is called Mind Valley. And they focus on all aspects of being a better individual, like you said, sir. I wonder if we as a faculty can collaborate with Mind Valley or institutes like such to bring their programs here for all of our students. Now that, that would be a definite yes. Um, all of these things require uh, a huge degree of financial input. Um, Professor Rohan Sirivadin is a rich hepatobiliary transplant surgeon. He will be able to contribute even if the faculty does not. I'll be happy to contribute as well if you can make this a difference. But certainly that would be a great first start to increasing the uh, proportion of informal education that people want to take. And certainly uh, I'll be happy to help with that, uh, with that aspect, uh, provided it's put through the Faculty of uh, Medicine Department of Surgery, then I'm, I feel very close to the Department of Surgery. Uh, and that would be a great idea. I don't know about Mind Value, but I think that uh, this can't be a bad program. I must go back and look at it again. But if you think that that's the way to go, then I will raise my hat off to you because that's exactly what we need as medical students. At the end of the day, uh, when you become a doctor, it's not about how much you know. It's not about how skilled you are because you will find another person with better skills uh, anywhere in this country or outside this country. Uh, what makes the difference between a, a great doctor and not so great doctor is in our soft skills, in our ability to be empathic, empathetic, uh, in our ability to be able to stay that extra five minutes to take care of a patient who's unwell compared with running to a meeting and therefore getting late at that meeting. In our ability to understand that when a patient gets discharged from hospital, uh, we don't know what the home circumstances as a, as a house officer, an intern house officer, it's such a great thing if you can take that extra step to find out where the bathroom in this patient who's had an anterior section and going home from surgery is. Most of the people in villages have their bathrooms outside their homes. Those kinds of things is what you should develop as, as an expert, as an outside human being. We are all superhuman in our, uh, in our need to be medical doctors, and that's how we should be, be developing. But uh, outside a, an informal process of a single person doing it or two or three people, a group of people doing it doesn't happen as a, as, a, as a medical school batch. And that is because we haven't focused enough on this. So if you can take it upon yourselves to bring this mind value thing uh, into uh, your department, into, into your batch and learn from it and then show how it can be used for the benefit, that's how it will get accepted. Otherwise, your formal medical education uh, process does not allow for this because of limitations in time, limitations in resources. Most of our think, people think about how difficult it is to do that, do anything rather than how positive we need to be. So that's a great thing. If it involves money, yeah, we will contribute to that, I'm sure, uh, but bring it on board and maybe a year from now we'll be having a different discussion at this point about the use of informal education such as this program. Great idea, thank you. Thank you, sir. If there are no questions, uh, I think we are reaching towards the conclusion of this uh, session. So I think, sir, your speech was inspiration enough for us to grab the brushes in front of us and start painting the black canvases uh, of our own stories. And my co-chief editor, Sadhuru Aya, would you like to make a short comment? 
uh, yes chanaka thank you um so uh, today's uh, uh, short session i mean that that is something uh, that uh, so i've been in the medical faculty for 6 years now uh, thanks for everything but uh, throughout that those 6 years uh, the words that uh, prof kemal dean told i mean they were never told to us they were n- never told to us i mean basically uh, this encouragement and the motivation uh, that we got from uh, uh, prof speech i mean it's uh, immense i mean this will definitely be really 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 useful for the uh, first years and the second years especially for them because uh, what i am learning at after 6 years inside medical school uh, they are getting to hear it now and uh, that will definitely motivate them and uh, to and push them towards doing uh, better than what we did definitely to have a much more inquisitive mind and to look for knowledge rather than listen to what uh, the uh, all the lecturers and everyone is telling and to regurgitate it at the exams as uh, prof said so this is a great opportunity and a great platform for everyone to get together and move forward and uh, at this occasion i would like to thank prof rohan sirwardhan who's uh, this is his idea i mean i mean he 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 uh, he informed us and uh, told that i need to do something uh, to improve the research and to improve the thinking of the med- of medical students in uh, faculty of medicine ragam and i thank you sir that's a great start and because of you we are having this platform and because of you i think more people in ragam will be able to uh, get away from this the the, the mainstream that uh, people tend to call us ragam medical students i mean i would like to say that uh, they mean it in a good way but most of the time they do not i mean this type of thinking development of thinking will definitely help us to move away from that and the next time that someone says that's a ragam medical student that will be a compliment for us that will be the sign of a doctor who did good a doctor who invented something this is the i mean i personally believe and we all feel that this is a great pathway towards that and uh, i would like to thank prof lakshman as well who's uh, joining us um, uh, all the time giving us comments and also uh, dr pramod chandra singh who um, who is joining us and giving us ideas and uh, uh, new information i mean uh, when uh, when i did the surgery appointment uh, what he taught us and uh, the, the the way he conducted the tutorials i would like i i am really like to uh, emphasize he encouraged us to think outside the box even at the tutorials uh, sir like uh, as prof uh, dean said to get a chance to uh, give a chance for the students to think outside the box and uh, dr uh, pramod is um, doing it already and uh, i believe that this is a great combination a great panel of mentors who who is there to guide all of us and uh, i would like to once again thank all of you this means a lot to us this means a lot to me as a final year medical student coming here and actually staying throughout this lecture uh, it was it was uh, something that is um, revealing for me so definitely we are looking forward sir uh, for the next sessions uh, for the coming sessions and uh, we would like to see them more often and uh, soon sir thank you very much excellent thank you so much for having me on um i'll be happy to join anyway um very close to rohan and um, and uh, promote specifically and any help you want from me i'm I have a busy schedule in my everyday life but uh, no busyness is uh, is an excuse for contributing towards education at ragam so i'll be happy to do that uh sir can we take one other que- another question or uh Yeah, I'll take. I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll take another question. Okay. Now, excuse me. I have a very very informal question. Uh, 
Hello, sir. Yeah, hi there. Uh, yes, sir. So basically, I don't even feel like I should be a part of this conversation. You are so great. Surgery people are so great, and everybody is so great. So, like, sir, what will be some of your encouraging words for people who have not done anything significant yet? I mean, at least they feel like they haven't done anything good since childhood up till now, or they just feel like there's a very big gap for them to reach from where they are until like the level of the consultants or basically anyone who's doing something great. So, what will be your words for people like that, them who don't have confidence within ourselves and Right. So, so my uh, words of inspiration for people like uh, like that are: everybody was born equally. What has made us different is life circumstances, and uh, life circumstances for some people have been a, a process of nurturing, where parents have have nurtured the process of greatness and encouraged and positive talk to their children, who produce confidence. So. Uh, I don't think that the person who's asking a question like that lacks anything uh, that a basic human being would uh, would be required to have. So confidence is something that you need to develop. But if you're that feeling that low uh, in your self-esteem, I think what you have to do now is not think about why why you why and when you can bring your confidence back. I think you now got to do something that makes. Uh, uh, the game change. And this game changer is to go out there and do something small. And there's lots of things that uh, from Ragama you can do. Um, look for uh, look for people who might be who might be um, mentally affected by the COVID. Uh, put out a notice there or go into a village and find out what the detail is. And then you can go out and serve them by giving them counseling. Or uh, look for people who don't have food. Uh, take whatever's left off your food and go and deliver it. Make sure that you have a delivery process. Something simple. You don't have to do anything great like invent uh, a new antibiotic or find a new vaccine for the COVID. That is beyond what you might be at your level. But there are simple things in everyday life. There are things. You don't have to be a medical student. You can be a human being who sees somebody walking on the streets who sees that person cannot get about life and who makes a change in that life. So you don't have to make sea changes. If you make a single change to a single individual, you will get your confidence back. Once you get that confidence back, it's like developing a research paper. A research paper is hard work. Once you get it published and you see your name on a, on a journal as a part of your research team, that's when you get your confidence. That's when you go for your second paper and your third paper. In the same way, do something different from an individual that makes you happy at the end of the day. And based on that, you can build on your blocks. So that's what I suggest for you if you want to. Thank, Thank you, you very the, much, sir. The question from, uh, from before was, uh, sir, sometimes our inquisitiveness can be unethical or controversial or out of the standards of difference to what we are learned from the books. As an example, Dr. Sergio Canavero, who is conducting researches about spinal cord transfusion and head transplantation, who has been disgraced as an infamous scientist because of the controversy of his studies. So my question is, can we trust 100% about the formal education? Can we be inquisitive beyond the knowledge that we already have? So sorry, this question is for Professor Rohan Sirvadana. Hello. Uh, no, sir, it is for you. Is that for you, Rohan? No, no, sir, it is for you. Oh, great. I'll listen to your answer. Is it for me or for you? Uh, sir, the question is for you. I, I could, I'm sorry, Rohan, I couldn't hear that question because the, the, the sound coming through was rattling. So can you please repeat that question? Uh, sir, can I read the question? Uh, okay. Sir, uh, sometimes our inquisitiveness can be unethical or controversial or out of the standards or differences to what we are learned from books. As an example, Dr. Uh, uh, Caravaggio, who is conducting research 
about spinal cord transfusion and head transplantation who has been this uh, disgraced as an infamous scientist because of controversy and the unethicalness of his practice so my question is can we trust 100% 100% about the formal education can we inquisitive beyond the knowledge that we already have right so uh, this this question is basically based on uh, or remotely if not totally based on ethics in medical practice isn't it so it's like the that's like it's like uh, the 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 three wheel guy who uses his ingenuineness who uses his uh, life skills and his ability to analyze to be able to break that uh, lock in that front wheel that is limited in its turn circle because it will allow the three wheeler to turn but in order to be able to do that he has to break that lock so that it will turn 180 now whilst it uh, he is able to achieve that 180 degree turn and that flexibility in his reversing ability he is also likely to damage uh, the the vehicle because he can turn turtle he can also damage people in that vehicle or injure people in that vehicle so uh, when when we are gifted with this ability to think outside the box there is this human human intention a human tendency to 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 get greater and greater that's that's the reason why they say you become powerful in a way and that power can corrupt it can corrupt the way you approach things it can corrupt your everything so in order to be able to do that you need to have a moral conscience uh, in Buddhism that is called Chetanava if I'm right but that is where your 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 moral compass must be in your approach to anything in fact there are many scientists who then have started as a result of their progress and their recognition have their ideas put on paper but not actually research those ideas but develop papers out of what are hypothetical answers that they give for themselves this is totally unethical. Now that is why there are checks and balances in the system. Uh, it is important for ethical committees to draw upon their attention of these deficiencies in the system. If you see as an individual, if you see something happening that is outside the books or unethical or outside your preference in a research environment, we have, if you follow a formal research program, you get educated on how to what is called whistle blow that means get to the authorities and tell them that things are not happening as per regulation there is some animal or something being hurt in the process of this research that is intended for good but not really performed in a way that is uh, accepting of the experimental subject uh, all of that requires uh, checks and balances and the same happens for you as a clinician we all understand that uh, you can do an operation sometimes nobody knows what you have done in the operation but at the end of the day your conscience your conscience is aware of what happened at the operation and you may not want to communicate that and that is in my my book not so right so i think uh, honesty comes out of your own personal ability to, comes out of your own conscience it comes out of your discipline it comes out of being uh, being a person who follows a path uh, a prescribed path of uh, a philosophy or a religion and uh, and uh, making sure that you understand that there is this whole thing called retribution if you do the wrong thing if you can guide yourself on that moral compass then i think things won't go wrong too much but if you see somebody else doing what is not in accordance then i think you uh, have the every right, despite the fact that you might be unpopular, to whistleblow and let it be known to others that this is not the right way to do things. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, uh, so I think we'll uh, add uh, almost like one and a half hours uh, discussion. Uh, can I just briefly share my experience as well? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, I, for the medical students, I was also like most of you all. By the time I finished uh, finals, uh, probably I was also like uh, studying for the exams. But uh, but when I when I started working with Prof, I, I realized that the way we used to think was different. 
and then only i started seeing things differently and during that short period of time i make big difference i think uh, today you all had a great experience and and the type of questions that we got today some of them were quite quite deep and i never imagined that medical students were able to ask such questions and that that shows that you have a great potential and that has never been explored before and i was i'm quite happy uh, about the type of the questions that we got today uh, and i think that's a that this is a great uh, start that we had today uh, and and I hope that we should be be able to continue this in the future as well chanu could you have anything else to add anything to any notices to mention uh, actually kavindra are you there yeah sorry uh, yes i am here uh, can you tell about the quiz we are going uh, to yeah uh, good evening everyone uh, i will briefly introduce our next event Uh, as it is very late so uh, among the many initiatives planned by the apprentice uh, the next activity we hope to conduct is uh, mind spark 2021 which is an online quiz uh, based on general knowledge related to medical fields so uh, we will be calling for registrations very soon and uh, the first 50 respondents will be selected to participate in the quiz uh, anyone who is interested in witnessing this event can also join us on the 2nd of january from 5 pm onwards and we will be sharing the zoom link with you all the event will also be streamed live on facebook uh, it will be a very interesting session and uh, it will also be a learning experience for all of us so uh, hope you continue to follow our updates and join with us on this exciting evening um, that's all thank you and last lastly but not in the least excellent work i'm so glad that you've taken this medical education thing to a different level that really is a new thing uh, i can see the amount of enthusiasm that this has developed and that's exactly what would expect of people like you at ragama and later on pramod as well uh, so congratulations keep the flag flying high i'm so pleased that uh, i was a part of that department when i see you guys doing so good so really nice thank you very much